Welcome to the second installment of our Two Point Conversation. To my left is uh, Steve Clare of Prost America. Uh, my name is Stanley Holmes. I'm with uh, Sports Press Northwest and soccer writer for the publication. And today we're going to talk about all things Sounders, uh, some things MLS, and we're going to get right down to it. So uh, upcoming this weekend we have uh, Sounders against Chicago Fire, and we're talking to a lot of different people out there in the blogosphere and elsewhere, in the pubs, the taverns, you name it. And what we're finding, um, the question of the day, Steve, is this a make or break a game for the Sounders? Stanley, it's the easiest thing in the world to say that. Now, every game is important in mm -hmm. a league where there's a three points, there's 102 to get. But in terms of saying it's a make or break game, you only really get to say that once in a league season. Deep down, I feel Ziggy has two games to get it right, mm -hmm. this game and the subsequent game. I think if he's gone six games and none have been won, then I think it's a fair question whether we just saw the make or break game or the seventh ones to come, but no. If there are signs of on-pitch improvement, I don't think the results will break him. Right. Now, the Chicago also has a, f a couple new players, actually a lot of new players. They've, they've shuffled their lineup fairly extensively. They have eight new starters from last year. Uh, two of those players come from a special country in South America, mm -hmm. a country we know well. It's a country by the name of Uruguay. Mm -hmm. And we know that uh, those two players are both forwards. As Ziggy yesterday talked about their uh, threats and their capabilities as potentially s strong players. Now, we have a player by the name of Alvaro Fernandez, a DP, mm -hmm. a Uruguayan. Um, does that put extra pressure on him, um, and especially if these two Uruguayan strikers perform well? I think the answer is in your question, Stanley. The very fact that you've noticed that and I've noticed that would make it was very hard for Sounders fans, should the two Uruguayan players do well, and Fernandez on perhaps more money is sitting on the bench, or even on the same money, is sitting on the bench or not performing, it's inevitable that fans will compare their Uruguayans who are functioning and succeeding to our one who's had little impact. So, yes, I think it does put extra pressure on them. What, what are your thoughts about Fernandez? I mean, is he getting a fair shake? Um, was it unfair that perhaps he was brought in as a, as a DP and now in retrospect? You have to be aware that he's a particular kind of DP to my understanding in as much as yeah. his salary was included in that DP money and his wages took him over that. So he's earning a little less maybe than other people who are on DP. But Sounders like the status of having a designated player. And I think that has put extra pressure on him. I have to say that last year, while all the fans were ranting and raving about how good he was, I already had my doubts. But I put a lot of that down to, you know, he had family issues, his wife was still back in Uruguay, and many people who come to a league yeah. like Major League Soccer, you know, have trouble acclimatizing. I said at the start of the season, in my preseason previews, that if Sounders were to make that leap from perhaps seventh best side in MLS, any two or three places up, it all depended on Alvaro Fernandez bringing it up two levels. So far, he hasn't, and although Rosales might appear now to be the alternative answer, kind of suggests maybe they don't think he will, but yeah, no, I, I think he's getting a fair shake. I, d I don't think critics are being unnecessarily harsh. Yeah, I would agree with that uh, generally, and certainly from yesterday's uh, training session, uh, Ziggy spoke a lot about Brad Evans and uh, Eric Freeberg as two players that he really wants to play together more, to get to know each other better, to develop that understanding that mm -hmm. the midfielders really need to, to develop um, to really take their play to the next level. What was interesting is he never mentioned once Fernandez in that conversation. So if I were to guess, and I'm about to guess um, right now, that Fernandez will be sitting on the bench again um, and our, the midfield quartet will probably be composed of Evans is the cam, center midfielder, Freeberg on the right, Alonzo in the holding role, and Zakawani stationed in his typical left wing uh, position, with Rosales most likely playing that withdrawn forward role, uh, probably partnering with O'Brien, but if O'Brien makes one mistake, he's out and Jake was in. I, I think your assessment is pretty accurate given what Ziggy said. 
and raises a lot of questions. First of all, you talk about a player being maligned and getting the wrong end of the stick. In my mind, none has had it worse than Brad Evans. A lot of the criticism Brad got last year was from, frankly, who people, and I'm going to quote Ziggy, people who know soccer, said Ziggy, appreciate what Brad Evans brings to the side. Yeah. I think for Ziggy to be jailed into a side swipe at that external part of the Sounders fan base who don't really know their stuff, even though they're the pride and joy of the front office, just shows how exasperated he got. Brad Evans went on form and in position is a valuable asset, even though Ziggy picks him out of a personal loyalty, and that cannot be dismissed. Brad Evans brings a lot to the team. However, I think your core point is that where does that leave the designated player? Right, and that certainly raises questions for future conversations on this topic. The DP issue is not going to go away anytime soon. It probably will be intensified as uh, the Sounders continue to look for additional players to supplement uh, their roster, particularly if they don't win. Now, if they win, they start winning, you know, those issues will likely go away. But, um, but for the meantime, uh, those are some fairly significant points that will be discussed on a regular basis. But let's move on. Let's, uh, let's move on to beyond, beyond the world of the Sounders, and oh, let's yes. move on to the Cascadia region, and in particular, Vancouver had a very <laughs> interesting weekend. What a weekend. I mean, yeah. I, mean I can't, I mean, Hassley, this guy's from Switzerland, He's, a, he's, a he's French, actually. French, yeah. uh, c'est bien, c'est bien. But, I mean, he scores a, a goal. He's been cracking, you know, up in, in Vancouver. He's just made a, you know, a tremendous impact. And he's apparently from all, for, you probably know this even better than I, but the, the, the fans love him, the players like him, even though he's kind of a, he's a DP player. And, and he, full of enthusiasm, he scores a great goal pulls off his shirt, throws it into the stands, and that's his second yellow card, he's out of the game, mm -hmm. which raises all sorts of questions about the refereeing. No, it doesn't. Okay, well, let no, me know. No, it doesn't. First of all, I'm going to declare my interest. I, once in a while, have got a lift to the Sounders Stadium from Sandy Hunt, the FIFA refereeing assessor, mm -hmm. and I do talk a lot about refereeing and refereeing issues. I actually tackled the four big decisions in that game and, and disassembled them. I'm going to say this. The law is clear. You take off your shirt, it's a yellow card. There's no ambiguity about it. Let me, let me ask you this, though, before you get going. Is that, is that a rule that should be in place? I mean, should, should anyone get a yellow card for taking their shirt off? I mean, to me, that, brings, that, that, that creates fan excitement. That brings the connection closer between player and fan. It's just a shirt. I mean, some lucky fan gets the shirt. Why is it a big deal? Imagine doing it at the away end in a local derby. Yeah, but that doesn't happen. Yeah, well, no, but it could have. The reason why I believe they originally outlawed it was it was seen as you're supposed to let the play be what entertains the crowd. Now, isn't it true, you'll know better than me, yeah. in the NFL, do they not ban excessive or gloating celebrations? It's not just soccer. There's reasons behind this, which would probably mm -hmm. take too much time to go into. I do want to return to the salient point, yeah. though. There was nothing controversial about what Toledo did. The guy committed a clear yellow card offence. He also left the field without permission. Mm -hmm. um, he left the referee with the choice of either enforcing the letter of the law with its consequences of reducing the home team to nine men or not enforcing the letter of the law. And you know what the consequences are of that. Other yeah. players then see, well, if he got away with it, so can I. And a referee will very quickly lose control of a game. Can I just make one further point? Yes, yeah, by all means. Mr. Hasley was very, very lucky to still be on the pitch. I'm not going to make that many friends in Vancouver with this, but the yellow card he received for bloodying Kevin Alston's nose to me looked like a red. And I think had Vancouver not already been down to 10 men, he would have seen a red. So I think Hasley, rather than have any complaints, should count himself very lucky he was actually in a position to receive a second yellow. Yeah, that, that first, that elbow was definitely... Absolutely, straight red for me. Yeah, no, I, I would agree with that. So what about that third call, Vancouver? This is where I have something interesting and new to say. Really? Uh, yeah. I saw it and I thought, not a red card. There's no two studs and there's not a, a clear mm -hmm. goal scoring opportunity. It looks like a, a hard yellow. And I wrote that in a piece. I subsequently received a comment from Roberto Alvarez, who is the senior referees trainer in right. Seattle, who informed me that prior to this MLS season, they had the meeting and decided to do away with these hard yellows and a tackle that was at the extreme end of the yellow card now had to become a straight red. And a lot of the journalists and TV people criticizing that call, like myself, didn't know this. 
So Toledo was, in fact, interpreting the instructions correctly, only the instruction had changed on last season, and nobody knew. Interesting. So I found that very interesting, and I mean, there's a whole lot more points about yeah. the Vancouver game we could talk about, but indeed. there's something else on your mind this week, isn't there? There is, indeed. And that is um, Rail Salt Lake, and the fact that they won the semifinals and are headed into the uh, Champions League finals against Monterey, a team we know about. We watched them play and pretty much disassemble Seattle over two legs. They were the purple monster, is that correct? Well, no, they, the Seattle actually played Saprissa <laughs> and Monterey okay. in the, the first round. Yeah, one was the green monster, one was yeah, the purple Yeah, that was the purple monster, <laughs> Saprissa. But so, you know, um, uh, to me, what's, a really, what's really important here is that, is that Rail Salt Lake has um, shown that it can compete at a high level. And it's proving to skeptics in Latin America, perhaps Euro skeptics, that the MLS has a quality team, maybe more than one quality team. Perhaps they're creating a, a, an American style play, perhaps not. That's a debatable point I'm sure you'll weigh in on. But to me, it's a team that is a team of distinction. It's, it's pulling away from the pack. And I think, to me, that's so important that we have our own New York Yankees in the MLS, you know, that we have Manchester United, a team that, that wins two or three MLS Cups, that sets the bar high so that other teams can aspire and knock off. I mean, to me, the thing I hate the most about the MLS is parity and the blandness that parity um, that brings to the league. So I really um, think, you know, in my opinion anyway, that this is a really good thing that Salt Lake has gotten to this level. And, you know, I hope they can win against Monterey. It's going to be a very challenging match. Monterey, I think, has one of the best strikers in the Mexican Soccer mm -hmm. League. And they've shown when they played in Seattle, you know, how ruthless they can be. You know, I think in the game in Seattle, Seattle took it to Monterey on the first half. Niasse should have scored at least twice, if I recall. But they, Monterey just absorbed the pressure. They absorbed like a professional team, knowing what they needed to do, and then they waited and they struck, and it was two superlative goals that just killed um, Seattle. And you know what's incidentally, that's exactly what Real Salt Lake did when they went down to play the Purple Monster in San Jose. They knew they, what they had to do. They were up to nothing. They knew that they were going to absorb enormous pressure. They did. They fell behind by one. They got that all-important you know, away goal, and they wrote out the game. They killed the game, just like a strong Latin team would have done. So yeah, I think it's a very, it's a very seminal moment, I think, for the MLS. I agree. I, I would say that your, 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 your little diatribe on parity as opposed to a dynasty is a great discussion. <laughs> and we, Stanley and I, do profoundly disagree in this, and I think we should have a program about that. Yeah. I would also say that excellence and parity are not mutually exclusive. Mm. What I like about, about real soccer, should we call them the Cobalt Monster? Cobalt, what monster, Cobalt monster. They do, are, they are excellent in every department of what they do. Mm -hmm. And I, I will be shouting very loudly from them. They're a great club. And I think, yes, they have raised the bar. They claim they have no superstars. I'm not quite sure that is true. They're certainly, they don't have the big money DPs. But see, when you're excellent in everything that you do, and all older, and European uh, viewers will remember the Nottingham Forest team that Brian Clough brought up right. from the second division, who went on to be European champions. This RSL side is so well put together, so well constructed, that if you remember the game last year when they had a bunch of players out and a young lanky lad called Chris Schuler mm -hmm. came in at centre half. Yeah. And it was his debut, I believe, and he was outstanding, as good a centre half as I've seen. I mean, Tim Ream got all the plaudits because right. he played more games. Everywhere you look at Real Salt Lake, they've got strength and depth. Yeah. They've got other players coming in. And I would just say that they do have a superstar player or a star, and that's Javier Morales. I mean, I don't see how you, even if he's not a DP level player, I don't see how you can't look at that team, especially from the attacking point of view, and not look at someone like Morales, the way he controls the game, pulls the strings in the midfield, feeds those final balls. Um, he's so composed on the ball. He's that crafty Latin American player that that uh, just, just takes that team to another level. Is that why David Beckham kicked him in the 2009 <laughs> final? Because he was better than him. He probably was. Steal all his modeling contracts. Exactly. <laughs> uh, all right, well, there you have it. Another two-point conversation uh, with Steve Clare on my left from Prost America. I am Stanley Holmes. We want to remind you next week, Portland Timbers. Ah, yes. 
will be having their first home game we'll and, and, yeah, <laughs> at, at their new stadium. Uh, what is the name of that stadium? I can't stand that name. Jen Weld Stadium. Jen Weld yes. Stadium. I can't. Uh, so remember, no, no uh, pity in the Rose City next week. It should be a, a, a raucous and exciting time down in Portland for those who care about Portland. Um, you should. And you should. So yeah. uh, thanks, and we'll see you next time.